And welcome to the Aaron Katzman Show. I'm your host, Aaron Katzman, where we speak to you about your life, your money, and your investments. And as always, we're coming to you from the spiritual and soon to be financial capital of the world, Jerusalem, Israel. As always, as well, if you like this content, I beg you, please, please, we're desperate. Please hit the like button below. And if you've not yet done so, I cannot imagine why, but if you've not yet done so, please subscribe to both the podcast and the YouTube channel so again because of popular demand we are continuing on our series with entrepreneurs and today we have a really unique view because we have an entrepreneur who is coaching entrepreneurs right that's really interesting it's my pleasure to welcome to the show debbie sasson who is a business and money mindset coach and former financial planner she helps midlife entrepreneurs make more money and grow wealth without burnout and sacrificing their family because money is so intimately involved with everything we do in business, Debbie believes that clearing your money blocks makes everything else easier. Debbie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to be here, Aaron. Appreciate that. So tell us a little bit about your background because it's pretty unique. You've done some pretty cool things. Once you give us your background, tell us how you transitioned, first of all, into yourself becoming an entrepreneur, and then we will uh, get into what you do. I think I was actually born an entrepreneur. I was one of those kids who really had a lemonade stand when she was growing up. We had a lemon tree in our backyard, so I would squeeze the lemons, take sugar from mom and dad and some Dixie cups from the pantry and make a lemonade and, and go sell it on the street corner. Um, and I also, I don't know what the age range is of your listeners, but back during the oil crisis in 1973-74, when cars would be lining up to fill their gas tanks at 6.30 in the morning, I bought some donuts at the supermarket and hitched a box to the back of my bike. And I was selling donuts and coffee to drivers uh, first thing in the morning. So I think I was born an entrepreneur. So I took the long way around to entrepreneurship. I've really been involved in money since the 1980s. My, my job straight out of college was as a financial analyst on Wall Street. I worked on a trading floor in New York and London. And then when I came to Israel 34 years ago, I worked at the Bank of Israel. I started in the dealing room. I was a co-manager of the portfolio of foreign currency reserves here in Israel. And then I was in the economics department where we would do performance analysis and also part of the monetary policy committee where we would present to the bank governor once a month. And then after my eighth child was born 15 years ago, I was I was like enough I can't uh, I can't keep doing this I live in Beit Shemesh for those listeners who know anything about the Israel uh, topography and so I was traveling every day from Beit Shemesh to Jerusalem and I just couldn't do it anymore so I left the Bank of Israel transitioned into financial planning for real people and that's when I discovered that people have a lot of emotional charge and triggers around money. Mm -hmm. And you know that I'm sure as an investment manager, and it doesn't matter if somebody's a hundred thousand dollars in debt or if they have five million dollars in investments, everybody has money stuff. And a lot of emotional triggers, people who could be very conservative in their investments because they're afraid of losing money. And especially we're talking in November, 2022, the stock market is down this year. That makes people nervous and panicky. I don't know how many phone calls you've gotten from people wanting to pull their money out of the markets, but this is not a good time to pull your money out of the markets unless you really, really need money because the markets go in waves. Anyway, so I started to search out more information about money and triggers and money blocks. And really over the 14 years that I have been in business as an entrepreneur, I transitioned from financial planning and then I added money coaching. And then from money coaching people and people, as I was growing my business, people started asking me to help them grow their businesses. And it was really the angle of money because people can give you strategy for your business, like go out, do this, but we procrastinate and we get lost making fancy graphics. You know, now people use Canva and they make fancy graphics or we don't do what we ostensibly want to do. And so much of the time it boils down to money blocks like thinking that people aren't going to pay us or we're charging too much. We can't raise our prices. All those other people in the world, whoever they are, all the people, it's like little monkeys in our minds. They're telling us like, they're going to say, how dare she? Who does she think she is? And we have blocks to money. And when we uncover them, 
really deconstruct them. So many of them go back to our family of origin story around money. And when we can rewrite the story, we can really open ourselves to so much abundance that I think we really believe is in the world. Like we see there's a God, there's a world, there's a world. It's a miracle that you and I are both living here in Israel, right? Like a hundred years ago, people would have thought that it would be crazy what's happening in Israel today, that it's an impossible dream, but you and I are living the dream, right? Here we are, startup nation. <laughs> I've been here for a long time. I've seen the growth and development in Israel over the last 34 years, and it really is a modern day miracle. There is so much abundance in the world, and we have an infinite creator who has given all of that to us. So you had the bug, as you said, right? When you, as a kid, right, you always sort of had entrepreneurial tendencies. And then you, you, you really, you know, took the leap after you moved to a foreign country where there's mm -hmm. a foreign language, right? It's not right. doing it in, I believe you're from LA or from California, right? You're, you're not setting right. up a new business in sort of a business culture, which you're sort of familiar with. Talk about sort of the challenge that that was like, and that still is like having a business um, with, with other challenges, not just regular everyday challenges, but sort of a cultural challenge. If you find that that's an issue even. Well, most of my clients are English speakers. Oh. I have had over the years, some Hebrew speakers and I can speak fluent Hebrew. That was one of the assets that I gained at the Bank of Israel as I learned how to speak Hebrew. I mean, I was in Ulpan. I started in Kita Aleph. So I started at the bottom of the totem pole and I learned, and I do have a facility for language, unlike some Anglos who've been here for at least as long as I have, maybe even longer, like my husband, who's been here a year longer than I have. Um, <laughs> he's not so good with languages. So I, but I speak much more fluently and fluently about what I do in my mother tongue, which is, which is English. Okay. So there are plenty of entrepreneurs in Israel and outside of Israel who, and I speak their language and my husband's English. So I speak American, he speaks English. So I can even speak to people in, in the Queens English or the Kings English now. <laughs> Kings, you don't, you don't want to mess that up. Um, so did you find that it was difficult for you to, to start a business yourself? Well, I had a mentor when I, when I transitioned into financial planning, I had a mentor who helped me start my business and really what my business started to take off four years ago. Like, first of all, I have a large family. I said, I have eight kids. So there was a long period of time that I kept my business simmering because I'm a mom of a large family and I didn't mm -hmm. want to completely abandon my family. My kids might have other thoughts about that, how much I abandoned them, but you can go and interview them a different time, what it's like to be the children of an entre of entrepreneur. We all have that issue. There'll be a therapy <laughs> class. Uh, next, next, next show, we're going to bring on a therapist. So, but I, but I, you know, did want to and need to be home with them. And, uh, you know, whether, you know, when some of our kids were going through whatever life issues they were going through, there was a time that I really, really turned down the the volume on my business so that I could be more at home because that's what was necessary. But then four years ago, I really started doing some deeper work on my money stuff as an entrepreneur. It's almost five years ago, actually, because it, it was 2018. And I noticed where my blocks to money were and my family of origin stuff around money. And so many of us in the Jewish world, our history, our lineage comes from the Holocaust. Mine did for sure. All of my grandparents were from Germany. My dad was born in Germany in 1938. My mom was born in America in 1939, right after her parents you know, escaped from Nazi Germany. And they grew up in scarcity and they grew up in hustle trying to rebuild their lives like my parents right after running away from Nazi Germany or like in the Jewish history, even maybe families that grew up on the Lower East Side earlier, you know, in the in the 1900s, early 1900s, but they had nothing. And if we just look at the trajectory of Jewish history over 2000 or more years, we go from feast to famine to feast to famine. And, you know, I have this like thought that I joke about sometimes with some with some of my friends that one day I'm just going to write, you know, uh, my PhD thesis on like, you know, the the feast to famine cycle and how how deprivation is wired into our into our DNA as uh, as Jews. But I probably will never do it. I'll just do the work I do. But but. But I know from my personal family story that scarcity was part of it. 
not intentionally, not intentionally. It was just the reality. My dad's a great couponer. <laughs> I got my older brother's hand-me-down clothes as, you know, my, my dad actually worked for his father-in-law before my parents got divorced. Then he was persona non grata and he was um, made redundant. But um, anyway, and he, that's when he started his own business and became a successful entrepreneur when he was no longer working for his father-in-law. But there were like some, it's not that we never had food to eat. Like my mother remembers when she and her family had had come from Germany, they would have $5 a week to spend on milk. And it was my mom's family and her mother's sister. So her aunt's family. And it's like, who's going to get the milk? Is it the pregnant mom? Is it the nursing mom? Is it the toddler? Is it the baby? Like there was real scarcity in those, in that day. But our nervous systems co-regulate, especially as children to our parents' nervous systems. So if our parents are in survival energy, then our nervous systems will also be co-regulated to be in survival energy. And that's going to be the money story that we take with us. And that's why I think that so many um, Jews have this story in their, it's like living in your body. It's programmed into your nervous system and wired into your mind. And that's how we approach business. Like we know there is abundance and Shefa out there, but something internally is blocking us from allowing it into our lives. And we just like, we hustle and we work hard and we keep the midnight oil burning because it's just part of what feels so familiar to us. So that, let's move into then what you actually do, right? You're working with midlife entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. What do you do? What do you do with them to help them succeed, get their businesses off the ground? What's what sort of the process? Well, most of the people that I work with are not getting their business off the ground. Okay. My clients predominantly have businesses that are already going concerns. Okay. And they know they've hit a block and they know that it has to do with money. I mean, I also do strategy and I also do planning. I love that I've got a very strategic brain and a, a money and numbers brain, but we slow down and we really look at where their money stuff and where their money stories are coming from. What are the thoughts that they're thinking that they might not even realize they're thinking because we have 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. Most of them are negative and they live in your unconscious mind. Like you don't even know what's bubbling there under the surface. Like you could probably walk from your house or drive from your house to your office with your eyes closed. I mean, you might get in a traffic jam if you're driving, so don't do that. But, um, but like how to get from your home to your office is programmed inside of you. Right. And so your money story is also these thoughts that you've heard over and over and over again that have been programmed inside of you. And some of the stories could be like one of my clients a few years ago when we did some excavating about her family of origin story around money. She remembered a story. She was like six years old. And that's, you know, until we're like six or seven, we're like sponges. We're blank slates. We just absorb everything from outside of us. And it gets programmed into us as if it's truth. So she remembered the story of her mother going to her father to ask for money. And he took his teacup and threw it at the wall and it smashed. Now that's going to create like a jarring feeling. feeling. Like imagine you're, you know, just now hearing that teacup smash, you're going to like jump. And that's going to get programmed into something about not enough money. Money is dangerous. Money, you know, causes people to yell and scream. It's not safe to ask for money. And that truth, as it were, is programmed into your mind and into your body. You have a visceral reaction to asking for money. Or some of the clients, one of my clients, I remember from many years ago, she had done her own babysitting because she was an entrepreneur. She babysat, right? But she went and took the money and bought herself a dress. And she came home and her father slapped her for wasting money. And she had a lot of panicky reactions around money. And these stories that we have from our youth continue to impact the way we show up in the world, especially as entrepreneurs. Like when we're working for somebody else, we get the salary that is given to us. And we could talk about negotiations and how much we feel comfortable asking for and whether we're allowed to even 
talk about or brag about or shit, you know, with our managers about how valuable we are as an employee. And it's different for men and for women. Women have been conditioned and socialized to keep ourselves quiet and not be braggy. And, you know, then you're like aggressive rather than assertive and, and you're bossy and all sorts of other words that, uh, you know, like, like women are supposed to just like show up and serve and be kind to everybody and not like strut their feathers. You know, the male is the peacock with all the feathers. The woman is the boring brown one. And, and that's how we've been, that's how we've been raised and educated and, and socialized. And when you are growing your own business, you have to be more visible, not from again, a bad place, but you want to share your genius and your goodies and your, your gifts with the world. You have to get out there and market your business. You have to share that with other people. But if you have these stories that you're supposed to be quiet and demure and not ruffle feathers, it's going to get in your way as an entrepreneur. And do you focus on like female entrepreneurs or are you most of, most of my clients are women, but I do work with men also. Okay. Yes. And, and there's a difference. Sometimes. And, you know, some women might not have money blocks, so they might be growing to multi-millions of dollars and they have different issues. Um, men and women, um, have similar issues, but our social conditioning around showing up and being visible and, you know, being braggy or bossy or loud or something like that is different. So it, it is different for women than for men. Interesting. You mentioned offline when we were speaking that you, that you're starting a course. Can you, uh, speak about that? Yeah, I have a nine month group coaching program. It's called Wired for Wealth. And I'm, I currently have one cohort of 10 women who's, who's in my program. And the next cohort is starting on November 28th. And we look at your family of origin stories around money. And we really want to, you know, deconstruct that and rewrite your, your story. As I said, we look at your business model and what happens with so many entrepreneurs, they have many offers. They have they're, I think that entrepreneurs are incredibly creative. We can do a lot of things. And so, and our minds are very active. Like, I think that entrepreneurs march to the beat of a different drummer in an, in a certain way. We don't want to take the, the straight and narrow path and there are different people. Some are doing great in offices and some are meant to be out there in the world doing big things. And because we have like so many offers sometimes and each one of those offers needs its own sales sequence. It needs its own way to sell it. And if you have five different things that you're doing, you have to learn to sell five different things. And when I work with my clients, we really simplify what they're doing in their business so that they can scale and make more money. We want to focus on what is really your zone of genius, not something that you do well, your zone of competence, but really what is the thing that you are here in the world to do. And it could be, you have another thing, but we're just going to put that to rest on your like night table for a year or two until you have your, your systems and processes for your big offer, your signature offer in place. And then you can go and create another thing. So we simplify and then we work on setting goals. So many entrepreneurs are not setting income goals. It's fascinating. And they don't believe in their goals or review their goals. And it has been shown that you are 90% more likely to reach your goal if you have one and you write it down every single day. But even believing what's possible for you, right? I have a very audacious goal of growing a $10 million business. Now, I haven't even crossed a million dollars in my business, but I have my goal and I am really moving towards it because I want to change the way women and men do business and how much money we can call in, but especially women, because we have longevity on our side and we need money. We need to make sure that we're going to be able to take care of ourselves into our eighties and nineties and God willing our hundreds. Right. So I want to make sure that women have money and that's why I have a, a very audacious goal. So those are some of the things we work on. And of course, planning for profit. A lot of businesses are not profitable because um, entrepreneurs are spending all their money and not taking out money for themselves or putting it in their profit account. And that's also really important is to get the mechanics right for your business. Okay. Um, what I get people ask me all the time that they're thinking of opening up a business. And if I could give them like a tip or two, what kind of tips do you know, if somebody were to ask you, you know, Debbie, I'm thinking of opening up a business. 
you know, what's your top tip that I should keep in mind or top two tips? What would you tell them? Number one is just do it, right? It's like, ready. We, we have, there's this misguided belief that we have to get all of our ducks in a row in order to start, but you don't need a lot. You don't need a website. You don't need a logo. You don't, you don't even need to, I mean, I don't know who's going to listen to this, but you don't even need to open your teak or open your, you know, your thing, your, all of your files with the government. You can do that in a month from now or in two, or in two months from now, right? Just go out there and start. If you have an offer, you have something that you're selling, go out there and test the waters and just do it. See if people want it. Start talking to them. Tell people what you do. Tell them how you can help them and invite them in to work with you. All of the foundations and infrastructure can be sorted out in a month or two or three months. But let's test it out. Get some proof that people want what you are offering. Like I worked with someone a couple of years ago and, and I'm not suggesting this, but she hadn't filed with the Israeli tax authorities or the U S tax authorities because she was a dual citizen in a few years. Did she pay fines? Yes. She paid fines for not filing on time. And again, I don't suggest that people do this on purpose, but you can always sort things out afterwards. Just get out there and start doing what you do. And of course, we encourage everybody to file and pay their taxes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I said you could do it. You could wait. You could. You could wait. You could wait. You can wait for a month or two. Yeah. Like you. Like like you know. You, I'm not. As again, I'm not suggesting that right. you wait for three years, but all of these things will just stop you when you have the inspiration. Take the inspiration and fly with it. And it's what I say: ready, fire, aim. Right. Just like go. And then you're going to get everything sorted out. But otherwise, you're just going to be like, you know, oh, I have to get another piece of paper, another I dotted, another T crossed, another thing. And all of that will just slow you down. And then your inspiration is going to fizzle out. It's like the half-life is just very, very short. Interesting. That's an interesting approach. Um, how can people get a hold of you? They can go to my website, debbysassen.com. I also have my podcast, which is Mastering Money in Midlife. I hang out on Facebook, I hang out on Instagram and on LinkedIn. And if you're interested in my non-month group coaching program, you could go to my website, debbysassen.com forward slash wired dash for dash wealth. And you can check it out. That's great. And we'll put all of those links um, on the notes of the show as well. So people can just go in pretty easily and click and get to you one way or another. Debbie, thanks so much for being on the show. This was really, really interesting. Thank you very much for having me. You've been tuning in to The Aaron Katzman Show, where we speak to you about your life, your money, and your investments. Of course, if you like this, please hit the like button below, and be sure to subscribe to both the podcast and our YouTube channel. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we will speak to you soon.